Wow. Uh, <laughs> let's pray. Let's go home. <laughs> that was so kind uh, from my father-in-law. Um, and uh, I, wow, that destabilized me a little bit just because he is a man uh, that I revere. He's a man that I've learned so much from and a man that I want to be like. So I'll keep it short and sweet, but I trust you understand what I mean when I say that and how much I'm trying to convey by those words. And I am indeed married to his daughter and Jody's daughter, Bethany, and she'll be showing up here and you'll see my better half in the flesh. And uh, we have three children. Uh, Ella is 13, Gavin is 11, and Ainsley Kate is eight. So maybe at, a, at some day, if you're really good, you'll get to meet them. Um, but uh, who, who can say? But that's, uh, that's a little bit about my family. I'm so thankful to be a father and a husband and to be opening God's word with you uh, at this conference. What a joy. So we're going to be looking at the image of God and, and putting down some further track that was so well laid in the first session of this conference. As we begin, I want to give you just a quick word from John Calvin to frame what is coming. Calvin wrote this just about 500 years ago. Man never attains to a true self-knowledge until he has previously contemplated the face of God and come down after such contemplation to look into himself. Fast forward to the 1960s. 50 years ago, Time Magazine featured this question on its cover, is God dead? One professor introduced a new liturgy for the age to mark the death of God. This is an actual liturgy for use in a church. Quote, he was our guide and our stay. He walked with us beside still waters. He was our help in ages past. He is gone. He is stolen by darkness. Heaven is empty. End quote. This is the death of God in poetic form. This is what many people in the 60s started believing, and this is what in a form, in different forms, many people today believe. They believe that God is dead. Either they are an atheist, or they simply believe that God is immaterial to their life and to this world. Over the last 50 years, Western society has re-envisioned itself. It now understands society and the human person without reference to God. Dr. Ware alluded to this in the previous session. With the rise of death of God theology then, there has been a second death, the death of man. With the loss of a theological understanding of God, there has been the loss of a theological, more importantly even, biblical understanding of man. The chaos that swirls around you and swirls around me right now in 2022 traces to that death and then the following death. In this time, in this session to begin, I want to look at five cultural views that follow from the death of man. And by death of man, I don't mean that humanity does not breathe anymore. I mean, again, that the concept of humanity as made by God has essentially died. That's what we mean when we use that phrase. So let's trace five ways that your neighbors, family members, friends, and others understand humanity today. And then what we're going to do secondly in my talk tonight is look at man as the image of God with some entailments of that truth. The first cultural view we need to sketch, and we're not doing this just to take notes on paper or on our iPhones or whatever phone we may choose. We are doing this so that we will take this material and we will engage our neighbors in love. That's the goal. First view, man is matter. Man is matter. The prevailing view in critical circles today at intellectual levels is that mankind is evolved from an eons old combustion of gases. Humanity was not created, as we heard in the previous session. There is no creator. 
Humanity does not have a divine origin then. Humanity has an accidental origin that owes to a process that no one guided, no one oversaw, no one intended, and no one is currently overseeing. Humanity is just atoms colliding, nothing more. The human race has no real distinction from the animals. We're just a higher animal. Now, you hear that in a church like this, a strong, sound church like this, and you think, that's ridiculous. I know I'm not just a higher animal. Many people around you don't think that's ridiculous. Many people around you think that's exactly who they are. And that allows humanity to gratify its innate desires, which is what, by the way, we're always trying to do in our sin. This isn't going to be a session on sin. That's coming from Dr. Ware shortly in this conference. But it is true that we are always seeking a worldview that will justify our own thinking and desiring. And the idea that man is just matter gives us such justification. If I am just a higher animal in identity, I can live like a higher animal in behavior, and no one can stop me. Our second cultural view is that man is a technological project. Man is a technological project. I am teaching and preaching this, so to speak, in California, not that far from Silicon Valley, where this idea on planet Earth really has taken the most wings and flown. Many people around us believe that they are essentially a machine and they are able to hack the human body and the human mind and upgrade themselves. One of the main goals of this process is to do away with death entirely. For example, there's a book entitled Homo Deus, Man as God, roughly translated by a man named Yuval Noah Harari that has been a bestseller for some time. And it argues just that. It argues that man is constantly evolving, evolving upward, and we can put an end to our mortality and our finitude. Basically, this is a fancy way of saying we can become gods. We are gods. That's really what man as a technological project believes, that we are gods. There is no greater god to submit yourself to and follow. You are your own God. You don't need to bow to anybody. You are the end of all things. You need to focus on yourself. You need to upgrade yourself. If you do so, you will find all your basic problems solved. This is really secularized immortality. That's what man as a technological project seeks. It seeks heaven, without God. That's what it's after. Our third view about the identity of man today, man as therapeutic being. Man is a therapeutic being. The concept of modern therapy originated some 90 years ago, roughly, with Sigmund Freud, who's credited as the founder of what's called psychoanalysis, or more simply today in the 21st century, therapy. We've all heard somebody say uh, at a rough patch of work in the week, I need therapy. They say some form of that. That term owes to Freud and a few other major thinkers. And Freud's argument some 80 to 90 years ago is basically this. Every person is suffering, and the goal of therapy is to overcome the suffering of the self. The goal of therapy is to overcome human suffering. What you're ultimately seeking then in therapy is to cast off whatever is bad in your past, whatever your father and mother failed to do to you or did to you or your peers did to you or other influences. It's always something outside you that is seen as bad. Whatever outside forces have caused suffering to you there are different forms of therapy. For Freud, it's one thing. For Jung, Carl Jung, it's dream therapy. There's different ways to attack the suffering of the self. But the goal is always to become, 
And here's a phrase you've all heard. We've all heard many times over, your true self. You finished the sentence for me. Good job. That will be extra credit. See me in the hall when I'm done. Your true self. That is really just about the spirit of the age in two words, true self. That's really what tons of people around us from different vantage points are seeking. They believe they are a victim. They believe their foremost problem in life is that people have done things to them and those things have inhibited their development, their trueness, and in therapy, or not just in formal therapy, but in living however they want to live, believing however they want to believe, going wherever they want to go, doing whatever they want to do, they will cast that off, they will overcome that, and they will be who they truly are. And the corollary of this view, man as therapeutic being, is that we need to, and here's another phrase you have heard, express ourselves. You hear that phrase, you also hear this language, I need to be true to myself, so I need to express myself. Once you identify your true self, then the order goes, then you need to express yourself. And everyone around you needs to affirm you. Okay, I feel like we just mapped every bad thing that is swirling around us. Not through some genius insight, but just through tracking some basic, very basic phrases in our society. That is really the nature of Pride Month. Back in Arkansas, the aforementioned Strand family, it's a Scottish last name, it's pronounced the minority pronunciation, Strand, not Strachan, don't at me. Okay, the Strand family, the other night, fired up, we fired up um, Amazon Prime, okay? We often watch I Love Lucy, uh, Andy Griffith. My kids are gradually learning that color television has happened. <laughs> it's this really exciting discovery we're all making together. Those are when the shows are innocent and watchable uh, and, and good. So um, th we, we watch some more modern stuff too. But, uh, but that's some of what we watch. And we, uh, we fire up Amazon Prime and immediately the image that greets us, the image that greets my precious children is images promoting Pride Month. Pride Month is everywhere. Are you seeing this? And, and so now, as if all, all day every year isn't Pride Year in America in 2022, now we have a month where it is especially emphasized. And some of you are in corporate workplaces, and some of you are in high-level positions in business. Some of you are in public schools or universities or colleges. Some of you are in hospitals. On the list goes. And this isn't, this isn't something that is just popping up on your screen. This is what you are being demanded, or your children or your grandchildren are being demanded to affirm. There's that word again. Affirmation is secular salvation today. If you don't affirm me, you have done violence to me. You see, I'm not just supposed to be my own true self as I see it. You have a responsibility here too and you must affirm me. And if you don't, <laughs> woe betide you. Consequences are coming your way. So this is real stuff. We can acknowledge this, we can lament it, but some of you uh, and some of your family members and loved ones and church members, small group members, you're dealing with this, dealing with it right now. And it's not just gonna be Pride Month, brothers and sisters. We've gotta, we've gotta get ready We've, we've got to know our Bible. We've got to have that eternal perspective that was talked about in the first session. There are ups and downs. There are strange developments in human history and human society. I don't want to be a prophet of doom here, but we do need to get ready because this kind of ideology is everywhere today. Authenticity leads to expression 
which leads to affirmation. And that is really when a person believes and feels that they have become their true self, when everyone around them affirms them. And just think of how much that contrasts with the Christian worldview and the biblical gospel. The biblical gospel is anything but affirmation of our sin. The moment when someone most loved you is when they told you you were a sinner and you needed Christ and he came into the world to save sinners. It was not a moment of the affirmation of your sin or mine, but that was a moment of love. That is love, not what the world offers. So we're going to have to speak the truth in love. We're going to try to be as loving as we can in our manner and our tone and our words and all those such things. But far above even those considerations is the truth. We have to speak the truth in love in these evil days. Ephesians 4.15. Our fourth cultural view I've already been touching on, but it's man is sexualized being. Man is sexualized being. We're seen today as sexual creatures first and foremost. That's what I was just talking about. That is what Pride Month is about. The most important part of your identity is your sexual desire. Whoever you're attracted to, whichever groups you're attracted to, uh, whatever patterns you have within you of desire, that is who you are. That is your true self. Your true self is your sexual proclivity, your interest, your desire. That's when you know who you truly are, when churches stop repressing you, when family members stop trying to push you into this Christian righteousness or whatever it may be, when you, sh when you thrust all that off and you embrace your innate passions, your sexual lusts for many people, that's when you discover your identity. In this worldview... We have no fixed identity. We don't even have a sex. We have only gender. Now, we've all probably used that word, but just note the difference quickly here between sex and gender. Sex refers to something biological. Gender refers to something perceptual. Sex refers to something you are at the chromosomal level, okay, made by God. And gender refers to self-perception how you perceive yourself. In our new sexual revolution, again, we have no sex. We have no fixed identity. We can be whoever we want to be, and we can do whatever we want to do and think about even that term, pride. Pride month. Could humanity more shake its fist at God? Is that not, as Dr. Ware said, the direct repudiation of giving thanks to God? Is that not what Paul in Romans 1, as he quoted, says is the very root of sin against God? That what? You do not give thanks to the Creator? Instead, what do you live in? Pride. Yes? Pride. So, what a word to choose for our identity. Listen, we're exactly where God wants us to be. God's plan is going exactly according to purpose. Nothing has gone out of whack. Not a screw has fallen to the ground that was supposed to be strapped into the great engine of the providential plan of God. Nothing is going wrong in God's divine wisdom. It feels like it at times to us, but this is all going perfectly according to God's sovereign decree. Take heart in that. Would you take heart in that for a minute? Just remember the cross. The cross is the most evil moment in all of human history, and yet it is the moment when the greatest possible good is done. It is the moment when Christ dies for sinners. So if God can use the cross God can use our moment in history now for good, and God can use you.
God can use you. If he can use a man who is suffering and bleeding and dying, the God-man, he can use you and he can use me by his grace. Fifth view, man as racial being. We're going to talk more about this on Saturday. Uh, the, The Saturday session title that I gave was about work, but it's actually going to be on a different W word, wokeness critical race theory. So I'm just going to touch on this very quickly here. I have a whole session about it on Saturday. I have a book called Christianity and Wokeness out there that I think I shipped way too many copies of. So exercise the ministry of buying things on behalf of speakers, if you would, because otherwise the church library is going to have approximately 900 copies of this book. So digression. Man as racial being. This is a major way now people are thinking. In fact, in these notes, I've developed these notes over some time, I've had to insert this category. It's not a new category, but this has really almost displaced the others in our time in 2022, even in just the last few years. The view that our core identity is racial has become really just about the dominant ideology of the age. Critical race theory is teaching people basically to think that their most important identity marker is their skin color, is their racial group. And critical race theory, like wokeness, like social justice, all operate off of the Marxist idea that there are power dynamics at work in our world. And basically, what Marxism boils down to, whether economic, cultural, racial, or otherwise, is the view that if there is a majority, and if there is a minority in any category, the majority usually, when it has authority and power, oppresses the minority. You understand that? If, you, if that clicks into place here at 8, 11 p.m. on a Friday night, You have just gone a long way to understanding the chaos that is playing out all around us and that is going to play out for some time. If you understand the view that lots of people out there in uh, high-level universities and colleges and private schools and on it goes are educating children, children especially, not so much us primarily in this room, but our kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, if you understand that children are being raised in a Marxist paradigm in many places, not all, but many, to believe that majority groups automatically oppress minority groups. You have just understood, in many ways, man as a racial being, as a worldview. The Bible is abundantly clear that sinners oppress other sinners. We know that there is no shortage of failings in America's past along racial, so-called, and ethnic lines. We know that the human heart is a partiality factory. We know it comes naturally to sinners to draw boundaries and lines between other groups of humanity and then hate those on the other side of the line. We can all see within our own hearts partiality. It comes naturally to us. But what wokeness has argued goes even much further than what I have just said, and it calls every white person in America basically, if you trace it, if you pay attention, a white supremacist. And so that is really the dominant problem of America in this age, that there's a whole bunch of white people. Those white people are the majority in America, and the majority oppresses people of color who are the minority. And so the dominant problem in America is, again, white supremacy. When you go woke, you wake up to that reality. It's often called systemic racism. There's a great deal more to say about this ideology, but this is causing tremendous division in America. Many people in the last 10 or 20 years actually thought that we had made some degree, maybe even a lot of degree of progress along racial and ethnic lines in America. And that was kind of what, for example, my generation grew up hearing. We grew up hearing about Martin Luther King Jr. and other uh, uh, civil rights figures and the gains made in America against racism, which many Christians are thankful for in different forms. But that has all been flipped 
and America has basically been gaslit in the last two to three years, and we are being told relentlessly, and our children are being indoctrinated to believe that different people of different skin colors and ethnicities naturally hate one another, and the majority group oppresses the minority people, and this has infiltrated the church, and it is causing havoc. We'll say more about this on Saturday. We, we have the antidote. I, I cannot resist saying this. We have the antidote to this ideology. You know that we don't, we don't try to figure out a way to Christianize ideologies that are ungodly in the church. We don't try to figure out a way to kind of finesse them and sort of, they're coming at us, so we try to stand them right beside us and be friend, put our arms around them. And, you know, you're not really that bad. No, you know what Paul says we do to ungodly ideologies that divide? We destroy them. That's, that's not me. That's not a hopped up blogger talking. That's not somebody on Twitter. That's the Apostle Paul. Read 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. We destroy ideologies that destroy the body. They are destroying the body now. So we don't just try to figure out a way to contextualize them. We oppose them. We unmask them in love so that the body will not be divided and the gospel will not be corrupted. The sixth view I need to mention is very simply this. Man as the image of God. Man is the image of God. This is part of that antidote that we offer to man as racial being and all these ideologies. We offer the image of God, as we're going to talk about here briefly, and then we offer the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because where ideologies split and splinter and divide, the gospel heals and unites and renews. That is what we offer our world. But that's all grounded in Man is the image of God. Let's look once more at Genesis 1, 26 to 28. We have already begun to probe it with great results already, but I want to build off of what uh, we have already heard. Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. What a word. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This passage establishes numerous truths, which we'll now walk through quickly, and then some application or entailments. This passage establishes that we are not animals. We are not animals. We are the only being made in the likeness of God. We are not, similarly, atoms colliding. We are not the, 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 the result of chance processes. We are not just specks of dust in the sense that no one made us. We are specks of dust in light of God's magnificence, but we are God-made specks of dust. We are the special creation of Almighty God. We are made as the image, as this passage shows, to rule the earth. It is not a problem when people live on the earth and consume resources and build new properties. That's not something going wrong in God's economy. God is not saying, all of you guys were supposed to live on 10 acres, and you're just taking all these resources and eating all these blueberries and raspberries, and I am ticked at you guys. No, God made, isn't it cherry season here? Is this what I've heard? Is this? Uh, stra- stra- I'm getting t- mixed signals. I shouldn't have done this in the group form. Strawberries? Okay, I, my, my trip is now ruined. I thought it was cherry season. All right, forget it. I'm out of here. Okay. Okay. It's... 
Okay, well, good. I, this is called losing the crowd. Okay, um, God has filled the earth with plenty. Isn't it amazing? Even my stumbling example here, fruit replenishes itself. You remember that? I had a little tiny strawberry bush that I discovered in the woods near my home in Maine growing up as a child. No one else found this little bush. And I remember as a kid getting the berries the first time, and then they grew back. Is that, is that not a sign of something? Seriously, is that not God telling us something? He cares for his creation. He's made it to renew. It's filled with plenty. It's filled with good. You're being sold an alarmist, paranoid worldview where it is terrible to have three, four, five, six, seven, and on it goes, children. Oh, you're ruining the earth. No. God made this earth for humanity. He made it for the image of God, humanity. He made it for us to work and subdue and take dominion of, have property, own things, build things, apply human ingenuity to problems. We are made as the image of God to rule the earth. And this is all grounded in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Humankind is made for what is called dominion. There's a, what's called a dominion mandate. It's in, there in verse 28. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. That's not something going wrong. That's something going right. It's, it's very good to be a steward. It's very good to try to care for the earth well. By the way, any farmer worth his salt, I grew up among many farmers in New England, knows that they have to care for the ground. Yes? So there, those, that's the original conservation movement, farming. Humankind, nonetheless, is made to subdue, rule, and fill. It's a blessing when there are lots of little image bearers. It's a blessing when there are children in homes. It's a blessing when there's children teeming in a society. It's a sign in common grace terms of God's blessing. And when birth rates plummet as they are in the West and as they are in America, that's a sign of God's judgment. That's a sign of disfavor at the very least. And when adults turn on children as infrequently, as frequently, excuse me, they do over and over again in these terrible shootings, that's yet another manifestation of depravity set loose in a society. God, help us. God, help us be a counterculture. You know that's what this church is? You know that's what every Christian home is? a counterculture that, that shows the world that we love children. Children are not a curse from God. Children are a blessing from God. Children are one of the greatest signs on this earth that God is good. That's what children signify. We're not saying there's a magic number for every family or something like this, but we need to be a community that stands against the world and loves children, and cares for them, and protects them. We need especially strong men to protect women and children. God, give us these kind of men. The image as a concept in the ancient Near East was connected to ruling. One commentator, G.K. Beale, says this about the image concept in the ancient Near East. Ancient kings would set up images of themselves in distant lands over which they ruled in order to represent their sovereign presence. Likewise, Adam was created as the image of the divine king to indicate that the earth was ruled over by Yahweh. Okay, so if you have a pastor and the pastor goes on vacation and the pastor puts a little, a little figurine of himself right here, on the pulpit. I'm just saying, he could. That would be a sign that he still rules this pulpit. It's a little strange. Okay, I'll admit. But that's the concept. That's the concept in, in the ancient Near East that a king would set up a little figurine. The king ain't there. The king's on break, but the king still rules. That's what the little tiny figurine or obelisk or whatever it was in the ancient Near East signified. That's what humanity is. 
That's what you are. You are the sign as the image of God. Every single person is made in the image of God. Every single person is an image bearer. You're the sign that God rules. You're the sign that there is a true king. It ain't us. It's God. The image of God, then, we see, is not something in us. Image bearers have all sorts of qualities and gifts and abilities and roles and duties that the Word of God unfolds. But even though there's a bunch of theologians and a bunch of different categories on what the image of God is, and they're good and godly and gifted theologians, there's, there's a fair bit of disagreement over this matter. I, I would argue that the image of God is humanity. This is sometimes called the ontological view. Ontology just, it's a fancy word. Theologians love fancy words. It just means being or essence. It means that the image of God is a human person. It's not so much the quality of intelligence or spirituality or relationality or something like this. When you're looking at a person you're looking at the image of God. And I trace this, this, this is in another book I've written, Reenchanting Humanity, which I also ordered for this conference in great quantities. And the view, <laughs> the ontological view, is found in texts like 1 Corinthians 11:7. 7. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. That passage is speaking to what's called male headship, but it identifies there. Paul identifies the man in particular as the image of God. Now, if you connect that with Genesis 1, 26 to 28, we can definitely say both the man and the woman are made in the image of God. Every person, therefore, is an image bearer. But there is a sense in which the Bible straightforwardly identifies the man, and more broadly, humanity, I think, as the image. This means, if this is correct, and again, there's debate, this means that the image is not something that waxes and wanes in you. It's not something that rises or falls. You don't look at your wife or your husband when they're having a rough day and say, you need to image up this morning. You are not, you are at like 72%, bro, and you need to ramp up. No, the, the image, I, I don't think it diminishes when you get older. I don't think it diminishes when you uh, can't care for yourself. This is, actually, this is actually a wondrous truth of Christianity, I believe. The baby in the womb, the baby in the womb is made in God's image. The baby in the womb is an image bearer. That baby in the womb can't care for itself, can it? That child won't be able to care for itself in terms of making PBJs for lunch for a good long while. But that child that can't care for itself, can't sustain itself on a day-by-day -day basis, is an image bearer. That elderly person in the nursing home, that person who has forgotten their spouse's name, that person who on some days doesn't know their own name, that person, man or woman, is an image bearer. And you think, I know, Strand, yeah. No, people around us don't agree with us. They don't agree that babies in the womb have intrinsic value. They don't believe they are a human person. They don't believe the elderly are still fully human. They believe they can abort the baby and euthanize the elderly. Do you understand that's what happens when a society loses this truth? When it loses the concept that the human person is the image of God. That's what it starts doing. It starts killing people off. You think, that's a little, a little strong. No, it's not. It's what's playing out every day all around us. And that's why you as the church are a high and sparkling light on a hill. You're a city on a hill. And the world needs this light and the world needs your witness, and the world needs our faithful proclamation of truth because the darkness is strong. Mankind is made 
in the image of God. Nothing can unmake that. The child with Down syndrome that many countries say needs to be aborted in the womb. That will be a drain on the family. What a wicked sentence. That's governments all over the world, in Europe especially, say that regularly now without blushing. That child, Down syndrome, is fully an image bearer or any handicap, any, any challenge that they face for a lifetime or otherwise. Nothing, nothing can scrape away or edit or take away the image of God in any human person. Nothing can do it. This tells us then who we are. We are made in God's image. Our identities are fixed by God. God has said who we are. Though we rebel against God, we cannot change who God made us to be. We can deny our creatureliness. We can pretend we are little gods, but denial does not undo what God does. We may act like animals and beasts, but we are still men. We are still men and women. We are still humanity, and we are called to be the image of God, to live as the image of God, to rule, subdue, multiply, fill the earth, take dominion. What does all this entail, though? Let's now move lastly and briefly into an, kind of an application section. I have, I'm not going to say how many I have <laughs> because I have to go fast. This entails first the creator-creature distinction. We just had a session on that, so I'm not going to spell that out at length. But years ago, Cornelius Van Til, the, the great apologist, wrote this. One does not just look at light bulbs to find the sun. Knowledge of the sun must precede and be the foundation of light bulbs. So one does not look at creation to find a creator, but rather the creator is the foundation of the former. Therefore, true knowledge of creation demands a true knowledge of the creator. All the facts of the universe are of necessity God-created facts. So, what Van Til, this Dutch apologist, is saying is that we can only understand the world God has made in light of the Creator, and we must first understand that we are not the Creator. We are not gods. We are not in control. We are only creatures, even in the age to come, when we are redeemed in full, when there is no sin, no struggle, no tear, we will still be creatures. We never become the creator. In the new heavens and new earth, no one here will merge with God in some weird way. We're always creatures. That doesn't mean we're devalued, as we've already heard tonight but it does mean we are properly identified. Second, the image of God entails a creature-creature distinction. Creature-creature distinction. This means that we are distinct from the beasts. We are not animals. We are not higher animals. Yes, don't come at me at the break with your, don't you know we share 50% of DNA with bananas or something like this? as people now do. I think it's true. We share something like 80% of our DNA with fruit flies or whatever it is. So the people on social media raise that with you and say, see, they're, you're just a higher animal. And, you know, someone like me who's not, not very sciencey doesn't really know what to say about the banana except that I'm not a banana. I'm not a higher banana. <laughs> Did you get your money's worth out of this session in this conference? <laughs> I'm not a higher banana. There it is. We never, even in our sinfulness, as I have said, become a beast. Think of Matthew 6, 25 to 33, where Jesus is teaching his disciples to fight and kill and confess anxiety, a problem that befalls all of us. And he's talking about the birds of the air. He says in verse Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. What a truth about the Father, by the way. He, he feeds the birds. He feeds every bird. 
every day. Are you not of more value than they? God has underlined this. We are not a beast. That idea is super prevalent in our post-Christian society. So you're going to need in Christian witness to make this true. You making these kind of truths plain is not you getting hijacked from gospel witness. As Christians, we go everywhere. As Christians, we speak all truth. As Christians, we are glad to have worldview conversations about bananas and fruit flies and the image of God and all such matters. We are very glad to challenge unbelief wherever it rears its head. We're not shy about this. We need to be a people of truth. The market on truth is high. The market on truth is hot because there is so little truth in public today. Speak the truth. Speaking the truth is loving your neighbor. Living by lies is not loving your neighbor. You love your neighbor, Christian, when you stand on God's truth and in love when you speak it. There really is no other ultimate way to love than that. We are a people of truth. Third, the image of God shows us the value of the body. Now, in Christian theology, your body is not ultimate. It's not your idol, as it is for many people in our society, man and woman alike. What does our society more idolize than the body, especially beauty, although even that has changed? Now we almost idol, idolize ug ugliness as much as beauty. That's a different conference. <laughs> your body is not ultimate, but neither is it of no value. Your, your body is given you by God. Your body tells you nothing less than your identity. Not to get impolite, but it tells you either you're a man or a woman. Straight up, two sexes, only two. Your body is a vessel for worship. You either worship yourself or you worship God, and you worship God well when you care for your body. You see, you are an embodied soul. You and I are embodied souls. We are a soul that lives in a body. The soul goes to heaven to be with God when we die. The body does not, and yet the body has value. And so God clearly cares about the body by making us embodied souls. Fourth, the image of God shows us the importance of human dignity. The importance of human dignity. Because every person is made in the image of God, they have dignity and worth. You don't prove that you have dignity and worth as a human person. You have not lost your dignity and worth when you cannot care for yourself, as I was talking about a few moments ago. That's how our society thinks. Our society believes in extrinsic worth. That means prove it. Prove you have value in the terms we set up. In increasing measure in days ahead, if trends continue, by the way, Christians will be having less and less and less value. We are not those who are diverse, inclusive, and equitable in the eyes of the woke gods. We believe, though, the opposite. We believe in intrinsic worth. We believe that every person comes pre-wired with God-given dignity and worth. That's how we treat people then, even, even our enemies. Isn't that fascinating? We're called by the ethic of Christ to show love. Is this not challenging to you and me? To our, to our enemies. Even our enemies at some level have dignity from God. Now, that doesn't mean in war or other situations you would not kill your enemy. Do not misunderstand me. This is not soft pacifism coming through my words. Nonetheless, we are the people who believe, for example, that, 
There should be courts of law. What is a court of law as a concept based upon? It's based upon the fact that both the accuser and the accused get their day in court. What's that based upon? The idea that they both have dignity. We don't prejudge you guilty, as is now becoming common in the West. Much more to say there, but that's part of what the image entails. Fifth, the image shows us the foundation and ground of all ethics. There can only be ethics if there is an image of God. Listen, okay, I'm going to do crowdsourcing again. Hang with me. What is a common critter that skitters around Fresno and Clovis? I'm asking. Squirrel? Possum? <laughs> I don't like possums. Okay. Do the poss- are the possums gathering in that uh, field over there at 10 o'clock at night to sort out abuses in the possum community. (laughs) They're not, okay? Why? Because they don't have the image of God, because they don't have rationality. They have a a brain. God has given them a brain uh, so they can think and make decisions and and operate according to survival instinct and these sorts of things. But the possums do not have the imago dei, and so there is no ground of ethics There is no newsletter being published among certain possums about ethics violations. Ethics does not, seriously, ethics and morality does not exist out of the Imago Dei. It it shows you that our culture and our postmodern society is cheating, isn't it? It's cheating because it wants to take out the Christianity but keep the whole Christian framework of the society. It wants to keep the ethics but take the Christianity out of them. That's what is playing out around us. You only have ethics if you have the imago Dei. You only have rationality if you have the imago Dei. So give thanks to God that He made us in His image. And there are ethics, and there are morals, and there is a framework for all such considerations. Take it away, and you have collapsed all such framework. Sixth, And we will land this plane on a dime, I assure you. The importance of human delight. Delight. Delight, yes. We are made by God for God. We are made to know God. That's what humanity is made for. Humanity is made by God to know God for God. That's our purpose. We are not made for our own lusts and desires our own plans, our own schemes. We are made to know God. The people who are most happy and joyful are the people, should be, are the people who know God. We are the people who are living out life as God intended it to be, not because we freely made a choice of our own volition, our own will to choose God, outside of his own sovereignty, but because God awakened us for himself. So, because there is man as imago Dei, there is delight in the world. And this leads into number seven, common grace is real. The imago Dei shows us that there's a foundation for common grace. These two last two matters are connected. We can enjoy sports. We can enjoy food. We can enjoy travel. It's because God has made us wired to enjoy His creation. Christians should not be miserable people, should we? We might sometimes feel that way or have that reputation or something like this, but we we should be a people who are regularly marveling at color television or email, or dark chocolate milkshakes, or possums. Okay, I don't know about possums. <laughs> Common grace is real. And sometimes reformed and conservative evangelical Christians don't really have, we have, our category for common grace is about this big. It's like we're afraid of common grace swallowing special grace. Never let that happen. Special grace, God's saving us, is all, that's the theme of our song, yes? Now and in the new heavens and new earth. But common grace is not this big. Common grace is big. God has filled this world with goodness. We get to live, honestly, very good lives, 
a lot of us. We need to be thankful for that. Eighth and finally, the Imago Dei shows us, the image of God shows us the importance of human connection. Whoa, that's a curveball for the last two years and three months when human connection has been severely curbed. There's a lot to say in that realm, which we will not say. We won't even try at 8.44 with one minute to go. (laughs) But I will just say, we are a people, because we're made in God's image, because God has made us to know Himself and then know other image bearers, we are a people who do not buy into this idea that the virtualization of everything is good. We do not buy into the virtualization of church. We can't. We believe in the goodness of fellowship and relationship and knowledge of one another and love. We believe in this. Christian, wherever you are with all the lockdown stuff and all the madness that has swept our world, get ready for more rounds of this. And I would just encourage you, not getting super partisan or anything like this, but just get ready. Would you please get ready to stand for the importance of the church, of gathered worship. If everybody else gives up on human connection, if everybody else decides to zoomify everything, let's not be those people. Let's be a people who do this, face-to-face, relationship, connection, love, because of the image of God. I need to conclude. The reality is this. We are all fully image bearers, but it is not enough to be an image bearer. The Bible teaches us because of the fall, as we'll be talking about elsewhere, because of the fall that affects us all, that makes us all sinners by nature, we need another one to be our image, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches us, the language I use is that he is the true image of God. We are full image bearers, but Jesus is the true image of God. This is what 2 Corinthians 3.18 says in conclusion, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image, that of Christ, from glory to glory even by the Spirit of the Lord. So here is the deal. It is not enough just to be human. We need to be made truly human. And we are, by the grace of God, when we are saved, now God makes us, by one degree after another, to look like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that helps us understand we are not gods, but we can be remade in the image of of the God-man. What more wonderful words can a human mouth say? Let's pray. Father, thank you for these truths from your word. Thank you for these dear saints. Thank you for these dear people. I pray your blessing on us as we seek to live faithfully underneath your word for your glory as image bearers and as those redeemed and remade in the image of Christ. In his name we pray, amen.